session this plenary session this morning so say and then I, I am it's a pleasure for me to introduce Johannes Reusset. Johannes uh, uh, got a, a bachelor and master degree in uh, Norway on civil engineering and uh, environmental studies and then a PhD at Berkeley uh, in between civil engineering and uh, electrical engineering and uh, and Paula was one of his advisors. And after a short postdoc at Berkeley, he moved to the Portugal Naval Navy uh, School, and then uh, where he is now a full professor. Uh, Johannes has been contributing in several areas in, in uh, civil engineering, but at the same time, it's optimization, stochastic optimization, and uh, with the excellent paper on uh, reliability, risk analysis and uh, convex analysis in general, and, and more recently uh, in, uh, also in uh, convex uh, stochastic optimization. So he uh, has uh, won several prizes, and uh, more recently George Smith Prize for Informs in 2013. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, just uh, published a book with two co-authors on optimal search for uh, moving target in Springer. So. Uh, Johannes, welcome to this plenary session. Okay, good morning everybody and thank you to the organizers uh, for this fantastic conference, uh, really enjoying it here. And uh, it's certainly good to see that uh, there were no losses at sea yesterday. Uh, still many people around. Okay, so uh, uh, I would like to start uh, with a story from the real world. So uh, the U.S. Army, like uh, most uh, large organizations, from time to time will have to make decisions about how to invest in new technologies. And uh, of course, we don't know what is going to be the performance of new technologies uh, these are technologies that's going to be maybe implemented 10, 20, 30 years down the road. So how the army does it is that it brings in a group of so-called subject matter experts and ask them, can you give a rating of this technology or this group of technologies? And then based on those ratings or these scores, the army make decisions about what would be a good uh, technology to go forward with. Of course, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, these subject matter experts rarely agree, and uh, to, to, even if they, they somewhat agree, there's still, of course, uncertainty what is going to be the actual performance of these uh, technologies. So in such a situation, uh, I'm working with a lieutenant colonel in the Army, as well as Alexander Newman that's here with us, uh, to try to develop models of uncertainty in such a situation and then subsequently can be put in to uh, some sort of a uh, capital budgeting model. And I want to return to this uh, later on, but let's uh, uh, talk about another application as well, and that is in the electricity markets. We know the day ahead market is an important portion of the electricity markets, and uh, uh, one thing that's particularly important there is to uh, the day ahead, get a sense what's going to be the electricity load the next day. And if you look at this picture here, on the top you have temperature forecasts for the next day. And on the bottom you, go, you have the realized electricity load on that following day. So you see there's a strong correlation between these two graphs, so this makes us hopeful that it's possible to quite accurately predict what the electricity load is going to be the next day. Of course, if we develop such models of uh, uncertainty, we might be eventually get the, be able to quantify or develop scenarios of what the electricity load is going to be the next day. For instance, something like this. Of course, we're not certain, but we have a family of possibilities that we're going to face tomorrow that we then can subsequently put in to optimization models. Uh, another thing I want to share with you here in the beginning is in the area of statistics. M estimators, of course, you use widely. Think about regression, think about lack, likelihood estimation, you think about um, classification problems and things like that. 
And uh, what has been an increasing focus in statistics is to try to select uh, a criterion or a loss function, uh, as well as various types of constraints to put into these, uh, uh, these optimization problems, such that you really get good performance. Uh, and also not only good performance, but also that you make use of all the information that you have available. And uh, we would like to see a, a good performance, even if you have a very, a relatively little amount of data. So you think about bringing in things like uh, regularization, to make sure stability, and things like that. To just give you one example, uh, to make this a little bit more concrete, if you look here at a situation where you have a bivariate probability density, and we want to do maximum likelihood estimation. So on your left, you see uh, what is the truth, the actual density that we would like to reproduce. But in this situation, uh, we have only 25 observations. Of course, 25 observations is not a whole lot for, uh, for two dimensions, say five in each dimension, roughly speaking. But if we bring in additional information, maybe we're willing to say that this is going to be some sort of a smooth density, there's some bounce on the curvature, and maybe we know log concavity. If we do maximum likelihood estimation, we might get the picture that is on your right, which is, although not perfect, it is a, a reasonable good estimate that we might be satisfied to go forward with. All of these three applications that I mentioned here in the beginning are things that we have addressed using episplines. But before we get into the exact details and what these episplines are and what they can do, I would like to paint a little bit of a broader picture and talk about what models of uncertainties that I'm interested in more generally. Okay. So, of course, models of uncertainty could be many different things, but what I'm in particular thinking about here in this talk is model uncertainty, say, of an unknown parameter. Might be things like a probability density. Or if I have a time-varying quantity, we might be talking about a stochastic process that we would like to develop, or a scenario tree. I'm going to, in this talk, primarily talk about probability density because it's a little easier to talk about, but as you saw in that electricity application, uh, we also work on time-varying quantities, but these little things are getting a little bit more involved, and often part of the estimation would then has to do with uh, developing various supporting quantities, such as regression curves, help us to say something about conditional probabilities and things like that. But whatever the situation might be, the big picture is that we would like to formulate and solve optimization problems that will generate or produce these quantities, these uncertainty models that we're interested in any one particular application. And what these optimization problems are going to do, they're going to try to bring together the data with soft information, maybe assumptions, conjectures that we might have and we like to bring in in a modeling type of situation. And that's going to get us into an optimization problem that I'm going to call estimation problems for the purpose of this talk. Okay, and here maybe you say, well, bring in assumption, conjecture, sounds like getting a little fussy. Well, I think, in a way, I, that's exactly what I would like. I would like to make it a little fussy because think about it. Uh, models are models, you know, the purpose of models is to being useful and something that can help uh, us to make good decisions. So some of this is going to be somewhat subjective, what you put into these models, but we hope that we'll be able to uh, verify them, maybe cross-validation or go back afterwards and look at what's actually going on and make uh, 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 statements about how, what is the quality of these models. Okay, so there are three parts to the talk. First, I'm going to try to give a little bit more concrete examples of what I mean with these things. Then I'm going to give a kind of broad technical framework. And then I'm going to get into the implementation details uh, involving episplines. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to focus on the application of probability density estimation. So it's relatively easy to explain. So imagine you have a situation, you have some data, x1 to xn, and IID, IID data, and we would look, like to find a probability density f that maximizes, say, in this case, the log likelihood. And uh, maybe the data that I have are these green stems, so 10 observations, in this case, from an exponential uh, probability density. So if I carry out this maximization, uh, you say, well, I'm going to get something useful. Well, if I do this, I'm actually going to get something rather silly. And this is no surprise, of course, maximum likelihood brings up 
uh, the density value at the point of observation. So this is an unbounded optimization problem. Okay, so it's not very well posed. So we need to bring something else in to get something meaningful. So, so suppose, for instance, we, we uh, can uh, assume uh, a non-negative support, maybe something about the smoothness, something about the curvature, uh, that we're willing to put in as constraints in this maximum likelihood estimation. Then we might start getting something uh, that looks a little bit more reasonable. The red line uh, will then uh, be maybe what we get. But of course, if I present this red line to even somebody that is not very trained in, in statistics, uh, particularly if that person is your boss, it might very well be your last day at work. Because <laughs> there are few people that will think that actually the phenomenon that we're dealing with has this probability density. And of course, anybody that's heard about overfitting, we see this is certainly some sort of element of overfitting going on here. So it would be natural to think to bring other things into your model, uh, maybe log concavity, or maybe some bounds on the slope, uh, and then you get something like this. So this is a maximum likelihood estimate that has accounted for a various types of additional things. Uh, and this might be something that you feel comfortable with working with, and maybe you can go back as you get more data later on to validate this, uh, this model of uncertainty. Okay, let me give you some formulas for maybe some more complicated situations and see how we can also handle, uh, handle them in, uh, in this type of setup. So we're still in the business of maximizing uh, the log likelihood, and remember we had a bunch of constraints that we're bringing in. But suppose we have uh, a situation as follows. Maybe you observe noisy data. So remember X, that's the real thing we're interested in. But then it turns out we actually have observations of Y, which is X plus some uh, independent noise. We know, of course, that uh, if I have a lot of this data, it is easy for me to develop uh, a density estimate of Y. So let's call that F Y hat. That's the density of Y. And we also know that uh, the, the density of y is going to follow the convolution integral uh, involving the density of x and the density of the noise. And if I write it out, it's going to be something like that. And of course, I can put this in as a constraint in my optimization now, so that I only like to look at uh, uh, densities of x that is denoted by f that satisfy uh, this uh, constraint, and maybe allow a little bit of a wiggle room because, of course, there's, there's estimates involved. So this will be one example to bring in noisy data as an additional constraint. Here's another situation that we use, for instance, in various transportation engineering applications. Uh, we find useful there. That the, it's a little bit like an inverse problem type setting. Again, uh, we're observing y, uh, but we're still interested in x. Uh, and why is an output of some system takes X as input. Uh, so then we might do some sort of moment matching. If you have a lot of Ys, uh, we, we certainly can compute the cute moment of these Ys, and I can compare that with what is uh, uh, another formula for such moments, but which is of course is this, uh, where I, uh, the integration is uh, uh, using the density of of x, which is f. Of course, that is the one that we are trying to find. We are trying to find f. So now this becomes an additional constraint on what f should satisfy. Okay. You see, there's a lot of richness one can put in there in relatively complicated situation, and there are many more examples, of course. Okay. So these type of situations, what, what type of mathematical framework can be useful to try to analyze these things? And uh, of course, there are several challenges. On the computational side, we're looking at finding a function. So certainly, it's infinite dimensional there. We are uh, so examples of where we have an infinite number of constraints in the convolution case. And we also certainly have integrals showing up here and there. And you saw examples of that as well. On the theoretical side, of course, we would like to also, although we are planning on cross-validation, all those things, we would like to have some sort of foundations uh, that uh, maybe help us to justify these models, things like uh, consistency. If I acquire more and more information, what we're computing is in some sense going to converge to some truth, to some sort of actual quantity, maybe the actual probability density. And of course, rates can also come in there uh, uh, as something that can help us to justify uh, the models that we're developing. 
So how can I try to address some of these things? Well, the, the key thinking is the follows. These estimation problems that we put together, and you've seen some examples of them, are going to be contrasted with what I want to call an actual problem. And then I have two optimization problems, because the estimation problem as well as the actual problem, they are both going to be optimization problems. And I'm going to leverage approximation theory of optimization to help us to say something about the relationship between the two. OK, so what are these two optimization problems? Well, the estimation problem, you've already seen concrete examples of. And in a more abstract form, we're dealing with some sort of objective function, psi n. We're still in the business of finding a function f, and you can still think about that as finding a probability density, if you like. And uh, whatever comes out as an argument, or maybe you allow a tolerance, epsilon argument, uh, that's going to be maybe our probability density estimate. I stressed the importance of constraint earlier, and even though here I'm just saying let's optimize over a whole space of functions, um, I am very concerned about constraints. Uh, and I'm going to use, uh, just for notation of simplicity, I'm going to uh, use the standard trick about assigning infinity uh, penalties for infeasible. So this psi is extended real valued. And again, I'm going to think about as n goes to infinity, I have a whole family of these estimation problems. n goes to infinity, I guess, sort of more and more accurate. This might be n, meaning in more data, but it can also be other things that's refined, other approximation that we have introduced that will be refined, say, integral uh, that I'm refining, uh, number of constraints that I'm refining as we increase n. This, the space of function that I'm going to deal with, at this point, I, I'm not going to impose uh, much restrictions on the space of function, just simply there's going to be some metric associated with it. Okay, and what is this actual problem? Well, it's going to look very similar. It's going to be uh, some another objective function. And uh, of course, when I carry out this minimization, I'm going to get uh, some function. And that's going to call the actual function. And this is uh, going to be kind of the truth. Okay, maybe it's the true probability density or it's the true regression curve, or whatever it might be. So you might say, how, how can I come up with such an actual problem that will somehow be meaningful related to a particular estimation problem? And here's an example that maybe uh, clarifies some of this. In the maximum likelihood setting, we looked at this particular form, right? Maximum is the log likelihood. Uh, so what would be the actual objective function in that case? It simply become replacing this averaging business with uh, expectation with respect to the true, the actual probability density function. And then it's easy to show that if I minimize this quantity, I'm going to get the true probability density function, or maybe one that deviates as most on a Lebesgue measure, a set of Lebesgue measures zero. So basically, if I'm minimizing this thing here, I'm actually going to get the true solution. So I, I can indeed make a comparison between these two. Okay. So what will be tools that we can bring in now to decide to make a, a, a comparison between this approximate problem, this estimation problem, that we can think about some sort of an approximation, to the actual problem? <clears throat> epiconvergence is going to be the key tool for consistency. Okay. So what is epiconvergence? Well, that's, of course, well known. If uh, this objective function epiconvergence is this, this, this is the requirement uh, to satisfy. Uh, let's here focus on what is the main consequence of epiconvergence. Uh, and it's indeed it is consistency. Okay, so if I have epiconvergence of these objective functions, and I have um, uh, some solutions uh, from the estimation problems, and you can think about this as maybe uh, your estimated probability density, if you like. <laughs> and if, they, uh, if these estimates convert to something, call it F0, that at F0 must be an optimal solution of the actual problem. Remember, optimal solution of the actual problem is, the, is a true probability density. So indeed, you have the convergence that you like, that as you get more and more information, you had convergence towards uh, uh, the truth. OK, let me maybe give you a concrete example of a situation that I think is somewhat interesting, where we use this exact uh, type of epic convergence. 
So this is a problem that is uh, of significant interest in statistics now, is high dimensional problems. So we have in a, in a regression setup, we are observing some y's, um, and I'm sorry, we, yeah, we have some data y and x's, and we think they're coming from such a uh, type of regression model. And uh, of course, what we do in regression, we, we, we like to compute the regression coefficient, the betas. And in this setup, uh, beta is a p-dimensional uh, log vector. And uh, we also put in a regularization, uh, L2 regularization in this case, uh, which we know have some uh, uh, beneficial properties. Okay, so what I'm particularly interested in here is what happens if we are in high-dimensional situation. That means that the p, the number of explanatory variables, becomes very large, in fact, the ratio of p over n, n is the number of data points I have, it tends not to zero but to a finite number. Okay. So this is of course helpful to start to study very large dimensional problems. And I'm also particularly interested in what happens as I deregularize <laughs> uh, by making this regularization parameter lambda n uh, becomes smaller and smaller. Okay. So, uh, one way to look at this problem is the following way. You know, this vector of a regression uh, coefficient become longer and longer. So we just put this into a space of uh, vectors that are uh, infinitely long, countably infinitely long, uh, and we're going to limit ourselves to uh, such uh, long vectors that are square summable. So this, this space script F that I'm looking at, in this case, is simply going to be the, the L2 of uh, square summable sequences. Okay. So if I have that, it's on the very mild assumptions, one can show that the objective function up here, epic converges to an objective function here, which is exactly what you probably would expect, that this sample average is replaced by the true expectation with respect to the measures that, that these, this data is coming from. And of course, what's also is happening here is that uh, this beta has tended to infinity, meaning that it's become longer and longer and longer now as an infinite sequence. So it is indeed uh, this very, very high dimensional, if you like, uh, probably even infinite dimensional. So we, of course, in this case, will allow us to say something about if I'm solving this problem, uh, I'm going to, in the limit at least, uh, have a solution of uh, this uh, actual problem. So this is useful if we want to study this type of very, very high dimensional statistical problems. Okay, <clears throat> let me make one comment about rates. And uh, <clears throat> of course, just to recap, we had our estimation problem, and we have our actual problem. The estimation problem produces our probability densities, estimates, or whatever it might be interested in. And the actual problem is a way of us to uh, formalize what the truth is, what is our goal. And naturally, we are interested in, in what is the distance between the estimate and the truth, it, which in some way tells us how good our certainty model is. Of course, it doesn't tell the whole story, and uh, there's a lot of things that go into such an assessment, but it would be one way to make an, uh, an, uh, a statement about the quality of a particular estimate. Okay. So what is the tool to say something about uh, these type of rates? Okay, so here we need to bring in the two Schwetz distance, which is a, a distance between epigraphs, okay? Remember we had the objective function of the estimation problems, psi n, and the objective function of the actual problem psi, they both have epigraphs. And uh, the two Schwetz basically is in the business of measuring the distance between these two epigraphs. And I'm going to, uh, uh, for the sake of efficiency here, I'm going to focus on what I call this hat quantity, which is an ac act actual, uh, it's not a two schwest distance, but it's an accurate estimate of it, uh, because it's a little quicker to, uh, to explain what it is. So this hat estimate is, um, you take a center of this space that you're working on, and you make a ball of size rho, and then uh, you go up and uh, place yourself uh, maybe at the edge of uh, one of the epigraphs. And then you ask yourself, how big of a box do I need to draw so I touch, this, so I touch the other epigraph? 
So in this case, I need to make this large of a box. And of course, I will uh, slide up and, uh, up and down here uh, and to see where such box must be, as, must be the largest. But I don't need to go outside this ball here. So I don't going to need to check over here, just live inside here. And whatever uh, place where this uh, box is the largest, uh, uh, the half of this number, so this eta, uh, that's going to be my, my hat estimate of the two-schwest distance. But on a high level, it's important to just think about the two-schwest distance, just the distance between epigraphs defined in a particular way. Okay, so let's focus now how we can use this in the business of estimating optimal values. And of course, this is something that is fundamental in many areas uh, of optimization. We want to say something about how is the optimum value of one problem related to the optimum value of the other. And what we get here is that under very mild assumption, we don't need any compactness, uh, we just need that this uh, row ball that we talked about earlier is sufficiently large so we capture things that are of interest. Uh, in fact, the arguments might even be empty uh, in this case. Then the distance between the min uh, of uh, the estimation problem, min versus the actual problem, is actually bounded by this hat estimate. What about optimal solutions, okay? Well, here I'm going to focus on near optimal solutions, okay? So you know, generally, it's a little harder to get, get your hands on optimal solutions. We're going to focus on near optimal solutions. So we're going to think about delta optimal for the estimation problem and epsilon optimal for the actual. And uh, here we have a result that says that if uh, delta is just uh, smaller than epsilon, and we have some sort of convergence, meaning that these two fellows, uh, they get uh, closer and closer. Then at one point, we're going to have that if I look at the, this uh, delta optimal of the estimation problem versus the epsilon optimal for the actual problem, they are not too far apart in the, in the sense of the excess. Okay, so what is the excess of two sets? Excess of one set over another is, is as this little cartoon here is attempting to explain, is that the excess of A over B is how much does A stick out from B? So back to our particular setting, we're asking how much does the epsilon optimal, the, sorry, the delta optimal solution of the estimation problem, how much do they stick out away from the epsilon optimal solution actual? And it turns out that that is again uh, bounded by this hat estimate. So we know that uh, any of these delta optimal solutions, they are not going to be far away from some of the epsilon optimal solution of the actual problem. And uh, this is uh, a sharp result, meaning that you can find instances where indeed you have equality here. Okay, so uh, that was something to say about uh, rates and the convergence and things like that. Now, so now focus on the computational aspect. And uh, here's where Epispan is going to come in as a useful tool. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that we would like to develop these estimation problems. And of course, these estimation problems often come naturally in some sense. Uh, you know, we have uh, a certain approximation that is forced upon us because of our available data. But there are one thing that, uh, where we need to make some sort of a choice, and that is the space of functions. So we have this script F that's been with us, and uh, we have uh, not said much about what that could be. And of course, this is the functions from which, I w this, the, the set from which I would like to select functions, maybe, maybe my probability densities or my regression curves or whatever I would like to deal with. And uh, of course, there are many choices for functions uh, classes that I can work with, and uh, some might work well. Uh, what I'd like to try to convince you of now is that the, the choice of looking at lower semi-continuous semi functions on RD is a choice that might be of interest, and uh, we have found very useful. So uh, imagine now, for instance, if I'm going to try to find a probability density in one dimension, uh, I'm now talking about basically saying that probability density can be a lower semi-continued function on R, okay? So uh, 
so let's say a little bit about this space and see if it's a, 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 even meaningful to get started working with it. Uh, first of all, we need to put a metric on this space, and we're going to here use the atouche wet distance again. It's important to realize that uh, this atouche wet distance here is used in a, in a second uh, context, not, you know, we used in another context earlier, okay, so here it comes in a second way, so it's not the same thing I'm talking about, uh, but it comes in a second way. Okay, so what do we know about this space of lower semi-continued function? Uh, it is not a linear space, but we have a lot of other things that we think are useful. Uh, this collect, it is a cone, it's a complete separable, it's properable, we know it's metric entropy. Uh, but maybe from a practical point of view, uh, a large advantage is that it's a flexible class. You know, there's a lot of things that can model by, by lower semi-continuous functions. Uh, for instance, you can make use of uh, the plus infinity feature when you do nonlinear transformation that we do from time to time. Uh, we have things like compactness of the balls in this space, which is, of course, something unusual in infinite dimensions. Uh, we have compactness of these balls, which allows us to say something about the existence of estimators, maybe a little bit more easily than otherwise. And there are other reasons that uh, maybe I don't need to uh, elaborate on too much now. But of course, the fundamental question here on the bottom is, now I've settled on working with the lower semi-continuous functions, but how should I even compute with this? We need to construct some approximations. Okay. So, the, so this is, uh, up to recently, was an open question, how will we will approximate lower semi-continuous functions? Okay. And that is where these episplines come in. So episplines, are simply piecewise polynomial functions that are lower semi-continuous. Of course, the picture here tried to illustrate that, how that when there is a discontinuity, uh, the jump is down, and in each little interval, here on the real line, uh, we have a polynomial of some, some particular degree. Of course, we can define this in higher dimension. In fact, here I'm trying to illustrate, I guess, in two dimensions. Uh, we even have an infinite dimensional versions of uh, episplines, but we don't need that here. So what you do is say in two dimensions, you hash up the plane here in different areas, and I try to make this a little bit of crazy hash up, showing that it's not, one doesn't have to do like a regular grid or anything. There's no reason for that. Uh, you can do it in any way you like. Uh, I'm going to hash it up in, in open sets, that if you take the closure of those open sets, you get the whole thing. And uh, on each of these uh, open set, you won't have a polynomial. And then at the boundaries, we just take the lower limit from whatever side uh, uh, is possible. OK, ESPL uh, is going to be uh, my notation for episplines of using a particular partition R. R is uh, my notation for a partition, maybe something looking like that. OK, so here's a result that is the key for justification. Why would we even think about using this episplan in this context? And the result is that if I have a refinement of these meshes, and here I'm going to uh, wave my hands a little bit. What is a refinement? We have, of course, a technical definition of it. But basically, we're thinking about these boxes becoming smaller or these, these sets becoming smaller, OK? But of course, if I'm going to hash up the whole of RD, uh, there's always going to be some boxes on the side that are going to be very large. So I'm not going to insist on having a uniform mesh, which of course would not have been meaningful if you have an unbounded set that you need to mesh uh, a partition. So there's going to be some sort of a local refinement. That's sufficient. So if you have such a local refinement, then if the episplan define a such local refi refinement, they're going to be able to approximate an arbitrary level accuracy any lower semi-continuous function. Of course, what I'm saying here in an informal way is that the episplines are dense in the space of lower semi-continuous functions using this particular metric of a two Schwetz distance. OK, so can this translate now into something useful? So here's an immediate corollary that if I now have made a commitment to optimize over lower semi-continuous functions in the actual problem and in the estimation problem, I want to be optimized over episplines. And here you might say, well, what happened to the episplines here? Well, uh, I'm going to do the good old trick that they're going to use the indicator function uh, to assign plus infinity when I don't have something that is not lower semi-continuous. Sorry, that's not an epispline. 
so this estimation problem is just in a maybe a cumbersome way written as an optimization problem of a lower semicontinuous function that being penalized if you're not uh, if you're not an epispline. Okay. So here you have what you, you hope, and that's a direct consequence of, of the previous uh, theorem, that indeed you have these estimation problems now epiconverges to the actual one as you get a finer, finer refinement of this partition. Okay, so this provides a justification why if I solve a problem with episplines, I am indeed uh, getting, going to get good solutions, at least in some sense, relative to uh, the actual problem that I was interested in. Okay, and what about uh, error bounds? You know, can we say something about rates? Uh, of, of course, we could, could do that, and now it has to do with how, how large are uh, these uh, partition pieces of this partition, and we can me measure that in, in uh, a certain way, uh, called a mesh size, and then we get actually a, an estimate of this hat guy. And remember, what was this hat guy? It basically was the one that controlled how uh, far are the optimal solutions apart, uh, or the optimal values, as well as the near optimal solutions, okay? So if you can get an, uh, your hand on that hat guy, you're, you're basically able to say something about how good is your uncertainty model relative to the truth. And here you see what you expect. There might be a, one, a result like this, where you have one component that has to do with uh, difference in the objective functions, and then there's one uh, that it has to do with how big uh, mesh you have, uh, how big, uh, how, ref how you refined your partition, and that will tell you, uh, introduce an additional error that of course you can drive down to zero if you just hash up uh, this space uh, in a finer, finer way. Okay, uh, what about the implementation of these things? Well, here is, uh, I'm going to just talk about a simple case first order episplines. So now the pictures are straight lines. And uh, just doing one dimension to keep it simple. So then of course I can represent uh, such function, you know, using this uh, affine uh, function in each little interval. So the question is now, from an implementation point of view, it's going to be easy to optimize now over these coefficients that of course determines completely uh, these graphs. So now we're going to be optimizing over these A's. Well, for instance, log likelihood is something that we worked on earlier, it's something we like to address. And of course, log likelihood, if you use this formula, is simply nothing but a concave function in A, so something that's easy to maximize. What about this inverse problem that we looked at earlier, where we did this moment matching? At least if we pass the numerical integration, that we get something like that. Again, you see this is actually can be translated into a linear constraint in the A's. So all not always, but it turns out that many, many of these applications that we worked with, it turns out there's a convex optimization over these coefficients A, and uh, is uh, relatively easy to uh, carry out uh, this uh, process of, of fitting or finding a probability density or whatever you're interested in if you set yourself up in this manner. Okay, why don't we return to this guy? Uh, remember, uh, by the way, this fellow here, what he's doing, he's looking into one, one little screen here. So this is one of the technologies they're looking into, which has to do with virtual reality. Basically, you have something like that, which sounds a little confusing to me, but basically, you, you're looking at the screen here that is providing information um, from somewhere. Uh, while you're working, the, you know, so if anybody interested in uh, computer games, that basically what this guy is trying to do, he's trying to some sort of computer game here. Anyways, that's one of the technologies that is pot was part of the scoring uh, setting here. Okay, so here's the situation. We have uh, 39 subject matter experts called SMEs, uh, for short, that score uh, every technology between zero and 100. There's 60 technologies in this particular uh, setting that actually was an experiment that was carried out in uh, 2014. Uh, what I'm interested in is what is our knowledge about a particular technology? If we, of course, I'm going to repeat this for all 60 technologies. And I'm going to try what is the knowledge about the future performance of such technologies. And I'm going to try to make an estimate uh, of, a likely, uh, of a density using maximum likelihood fit. You use your second order episplines, 
I'm going to bring in, as I talked about, various types of assumptions about what these densities should look like. And I might very well, for one particular technology, get this picture here. The black line is the epispline. And here's the scores between 0 and 100 uh, is the range, right? So you see that it's most likely to a relatively low score, this particular technology. Uh, <clears throat> of course, one can fit the probability density many, many different ways. And here are some you know, alternatives, say Gaussian, kernel, beta, who knows what you want to uh, use. But of course, all those things, they don't build in, they don't allow you any flexibility to build in other types of things. You basically get uh, what you get from the data directly. So the working with the epispine allows you much more flexibility to build probability densities that you think uh, are reasonable. Okay. Um, actually, it turns out that uh, these 60 technologies were not only scored by one number, but actually in three categories, depending on you know, how they could help the arm in different types of ways. So actually, we don't build those univariate probability densities that saw in that previous picture, but actually three-dimensional joint densities over those different categories of scores. Okay. So actually, we have 60 three-dimensional densities that, that makes up what we think about as an uncertainty model about the capabilities of these 60 technologies. And what one, one can do is, uh, one can maybe try to compare with what the army is doing currently. And of course, as you can imagine, they're not doing anything sophisticated. Take, they simply take the, the SME scores for each technology and average the numbers, and that is the number they're going to use. And uh, what we're going to do, we can put this in some sort of a, a capital budget, like a, some sort of a knapsack problem, and figure out under these specific uh, ratings, scores for the technologies, what would be the best thing if we just simply take the average of the SME as the, as the value that we think these technologies are going to have. So that's going to what we're going to call the benchmark plan, okay, the benchmark investment plan. And here is one picture that really shows why it's important to say something about uncertainty. And this is probably a welcome picture in, in this audience. First of all, this black triangle on the bottom the black triangle on the bottom is saying what, if I just simply take the average of the SME scores, this is what the number those averages think this particular benchmark plan is going to uh, uh, generate. Total over the 60 technologies. So it's a little bit, so it's a total score over 60 technologies. Many of them were not even uh, invested in because we don't have the money for it maybe. But this is what we think that might be. Of course, when reality hits, we know that that is not what's going to be going on. If we accept our model of uncertainty the way we developed, uh, we talked about, then we're going to get this purple PDF, the multivariate epispline. The purple PDF is the one that is, uh, I guess, the lowest one here. And uh, so the purple PDF is the lowest one. And you basically, this is, if we accept our model of uncertainty of these scores and we stick to the benchmark plan, you see that actually a reality be much, much worse than what was nominally predicted. We might get a total score that's much, much lower. And of course, that is what you get the general to sit up straight because, see, that things can go really sour. Okay? And one purpose of developing such uncertainty models is to specifically highlight that if you account for uncertainty, uh, life might not be as rosy as you thought originally, and you see that things can go uh, very, uh, uh, at least relatively badly. Of course, one can do this in different other ways, and that's this other uh, density. But let me just quickly tell you that, of course, we did also optimize now uh, using this uncertainty model. And you might say, well, maybe we should do like a multi-stage model here, and investment is typically like a multi-stage decision, but uh, the army doesn't want to hear anything about multi-stage. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that like, we need to make small steps working with somebody that is um, a particular organization. So this is simply a, a one-stage model where we want to minimize the, uh, the, simply the risk of things going sour. And here we use the 0.9 superquanta risk. And by the way, uh, of course, superquanta is what many of you know as conditional value to risk and average value of risk. And we just simply use superquanta for the reason that when we work with people outside finance, we feel that this, it's, it's more natural to use such an application-neutral term. Um, so if we try to 
use that as a criterion in our knapsack model, uh, of course, we get the picture that is, to some sense, the money slide uh, is that if I compare this benchmark design that was obtained, then benchmark plan that was obtained just in a deterministic way, with the one optimized where we deal with risk, we get indeed this type of uh, improvement that you see that we like to move to the right, and you see that the optimized, the pink uh, PDF uh, has moved to the right. So actually in this case, even though we only worked on the lower tail and worked on that bringing it up, actually the whole PDF was, came up. So even the mean performance improved by optimizing uh, the risk. And I think uh, I, I better stop here and uh, open for any questions. Thank you. Okay, we have time for two short questions. Comment. No. Okay. No. no. Thank you again. Thank you.